Hi guys, as my as, as uh, you know, my name is Anand Deepak, and I'll be talking to you about our XTP or eBPF based firewall implementation at uh, Facebook. So a little primer of what we'll be you know talking about in today's session. I'll give you a background about IP tables because that was the motivation for us to implement our firewall policy in XTP. So we'll visit that background and, and discuss what were the motivating factors. Uh, then we'll discuss in details about our firewall implementation. I'll go into specifics, share some deployment uh, lessons that we learned, talk about uh, the performance that we see between an IP tables based implementation uh, versus the XTP based. And lastly, we'll touch upon a prototype that we built having learned uh, from our experience of building a firewall in XDP uh, as a generic way to, to configure a firewall using IP tables but implementing it in BPF. And that effort sort of maps into the BP filter project or initiative uh, that the community is trying to take on. And hopefully we can share some of our lessons and influence that direction. So IP tables. So IP tables has existed since a long time. It's the de facto host filtering mechanism in Linux. It's extremely intuitive to use. People know how to configure it. And it's straightforward, and people like it for its simplicity. Its implementation reflects that simplicity. So in essence, what it is is a list of ordered rules. And each incoming packet is trying to f go through the list of rules and find the first rule that it can match and then take action or, you know, a which is configured for that specific rule. And if no rule is matched, you take the default policy, which in most cases is just dropping the packet. So here's what an input chain would look like in IP tables. You essentially have a table, which is you're opening some ports to the internet, then you start sort of specifying more specific rules. You may want to open specific ports to some specific destinations, so on and so forth, and then you have a drop policy in the end. Now this looks nice, simple, great, but if you start to look carefully, um, imagine a packet that happens to match a lower order rule in there. Now what that packet has done is it has spent a bunch of CPU cycles trying to match against all these previous rules, only to have arrived at that nth rule, and then take some action, which could be permit in this case. Even worse, if it were to be dropped, it would spend like a few more cycles matching against a few more rules. Now, if it's 10 or 15 rules, this isn't a problem. But imagine you have like hundreds of rules. You'll notice, uh, and, and we could notice it, that you know, if you compare a high performance packet stream against a rule that matches the, the first order rule versus something which matches a much lower order rule, you'll see a lot of variance. And the CPU utilization varies dramatically. Now, when you're operating a, a large network, the last thing you want is variance in the util CPU utilization based on incoming traffic stream. That's an extremely undesirable characteristic when managing a large tier. So we wanted to focus on that and see what we could do about it. So before we jump onto our implementation, I wanted to again take a step back and uh, try to explain or rather describe that even though this IP tables looks like one monolithic table, which has a bunch of rules, it has a bunch of port numbers, and some IP addresses and prefixes. It really is two things. It's a policy that some security person has defined. And then it's filled with a bunch of characteristics of that specific topology, port numbers and network prefixes, so on and so forth. And just hold on to that thought, because this was also one of the motivation that we had when we, we re-implemented or rather implemented our firewall policy in XDP is that we wanted to focus on this logical separation of 
a policy uh, versus data representing that network topology. Also, there are features like IP set in the kernel that can address some of these concerns that I ra uh, raised in the earlier slide about uh, matching packets. So, you know, just keep that in mind. All right. So let's talk about firewall um, in XTP that we have implemented at Facebook. First, let's talk about why did we want to do this in the first place. So as I described earlier, one of the motivation was we wanted our infrastructure, specifically our edge infrastructure where we are doing this packet filtering, to have a pretty uniform behavior irrespective of the nature of packets being received. So this could be a high PPS packet stream targeted at a closed port, or could be a high PPS packet stream targeted to destination port 443, which is you know, where we are listening to all, for all our applications. We wanted our CPU utilization to fair, look fairly uniform, irrespective of uh, the incoming packet streams. The other thing is, Facebook has a bunch of networking solutions in XDP. So we have now a pretty rich networking stack in XDP. And you'll hear from one of my colleagues tomorrow about our L4 load balancer uh, called Catran, which is also an open source project uh, that is implemented in XDP. So it only made sense that if you are going to start ba load balancing packets in XDP, we also end up putting a firewall before that. Otherwise, we're just wasting cycles, load balancing traffic that eventually will not even be admitted into our infrastructure. And the manageability aspect. So I touched upon this by trying to illustrate in that, uh, in that, um, in that table over there. There is a policy that the security folks want to uh, create, define, have control over. And there's a network aspect to it which means application owners love to write new applications, especially in a place like Facebook, which is you know, extremely software-oriented organization. People write lots of new apps. They constantly want to open these uh, ports for these apps within our intranet. And so one of the motivation was we wanted to create an extremely low frictional process where application owners could open a port by themselves on our edge infrastructure without having to involve a bunch of security folks and make it a, a, a pretty daunting process. So let's revisit that, uh, that representation again. So we had a policy and a network, and in IP tables, it looked pretty monolithic in this way. Now, imagine if you could express that policy in a C program. And that's what it would look like. And we worked this implementation backward in the sense that you know, we wanted this C program to be human readable so that just like in IP tables, which is extremely intuitive to read, we wanted an implementation which over time is also maintainable and the security or intention can be easily expressed. So we had a C program which reads something like this. So how do we bring this all together and achieve all those factors that we spoke about earlier. So the C program starts off by doing a lookup for each of these uh, tuples. In our case, it's five tuples. So the source address, destination address, source post, destination port, protocol. And we also have uh, lookups on prefixes. And we collect all these results for each tuple of a packet. And this is done for each and every packet that comes in. The BPF map itself for each of these tuples is loaded with, obviously, a key and a value, the key being the specific attribute. So let's say port 443 for a TCP port. But the value here is an identifier. And that identifier is a logical representation of what logical group does that port belong to. And herein lies the manageability win. So what we have is a configuration script, or a, I would call a configuration system, which does three things. It creates these 
logical representations for each attribute. So let me take the example of TCP port. So it represents some ports calling TCP public. This would be destination ports which are open to the internet. It would then call some ports TCP production. Maybe these are open to only certain production net, um, prefixes. And that aspect gives application owners a very human readable and a safe way to express if they want to open a port, which category do they want to open a port in. So if they really want to open a port strictly within our network, they can choose something like SameNet, say expressing that, hey, I'm writing this application. I want this port to be open to all of Facebook internal traffic, and I'll associate this port number with you know, an identifier called SameNet. So that's this configuration system simplifying the ability for users to express uh, or rather associate a port with a logical group. The two other things that the configuration system will now do is it will generate a header file that the C program can include, which is nothing but enums. And as you can see, it's the capitalized um, identifier in the C program. So this makes sure that the data plane is now consistently represented with our policy. And the third thing that the configuration system will do is when we load these BPF maps, it will make sure that the value loaded in these BPF maps has, again, the right enum value. So in this case, if TCP public happens to be a flag hex 4, this configuration system will make sure that the data plane and how we load the map remains consistent. Now, the exact value of 4 is internal to our system because from a human point of view, we have created an identifier called human readable identifier called TCP public. And that gives us the manageability win. So I haven't spoken about like core of the program. Let's talk about what does this firewall really do and you know, a few more details about it. So A, it's stateless. Now that's a design choice we have made. Uh, having said that, you know, connection tracking is, uh, as you've heard in various talks today, connection tracking is possible and something that could be doable. It's, in our implementation, we have a stateless firewall. It's deployed all across our edge infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, because we have a rich networking stack in XDP, we run this before our firewall. In fact, uh, any packet that is deemed to pass this firewall is actually a tail call to uh, our load balancer. We have some really good tooling, which will periodically scrub these BPF maps and check for consistency with our configuration systems as a way to indicate that our configuration is consistent, coherent, and as expected. Just like IP tables restore, which allows you to atomically swap a given policy, we can atomically swap our firewall, and this is thanks to the way BPF's reference counting mechanism works. What we do is whenever there's a change in our firewall policy, because let's say somebody added a new port, we simply compile a new program, load it in the kernel, create all the new maps, load all the new maps, and attach the program to the same point and drop the reference or drop the file descriptor to the old program. And there on the kernel then you know, has reference counting, it drops you know, references to the old maps and the old programs and it vanishes. And now the new program takes effect. So we get similar IP table restore like behavior with this firewall. Uh, we use BCC helpers just because they help us avoid some boilerplate code. And our C policy, uh, as I said, you know, the policy for any filtering or rather a, uh, a firewall is something that rarely changes. So that C program that you saw has had very few changes. Most of the changes that we see are folks are trying to add a port or a network prefix or removing a port because their application is, you know, they're deprecating it. One interesting thing that we did learn from this is, you know, when you're using um, the longest prefix match, it is important that when you load the, the LPM try, that you look for overlapping prefixes. And 
This can cause some interesting uh, results, and this is something that we learned uh, while doing some tests, is that you know, the, in the data plane, as the name suggests, it's going to return to you the value of the longest prefix when it's looking up a, uh, you know, a particular IP prefix. And so if you happen to have overlapping prefixes, make sure you use flags and logically or bitwise odd those values so that in the data plane now, when you get a result, that result can be indicative of having matched both those identifiers so that your decision-making engine can take the appropriate action. Just like IP tables where you know, pretty often people will log packets, drop packets for you know, analysis, we do something similar. We sample packets at a certain rate, which sample drop packets at a certain rate and write them to a BPF perf pi, which our user space daemon will you know, read. It, in essence, what we're doing in XDP mode is just taking the first n bytes of a packet and writing it onto the perf pipe. Our user space daemon reads it, parses it, and writes to our logging infrastructure. Same thing for statistics. And a few specific things for our infrastructure because now that we can write a C program, we can do a few custom things. So for example, we do C tunneled headers inside our infrastructure and we can go look beyond that. Uh, basically pass tunneled headers. So one thing that I would like to call out as a difference is in IP tables you would have seen that you, know, you get per rule granularity statistics, we lose that. Uh, and this is because now we represent statistics on an aggregate policy level. So we can say how many packets were received towards the logical group of destination TCP ports open to the internet, but we cannot distinguish packets received on port 80 versus port 443. And in our logging infrastructure, or you know, uh, this is not a problem. Uh, we keep things simple, so we have accept and drop as the two sort of actions we support. Rejects can be possible with BPF. Uh, we don't do that. You can do custom chains with tail call, call into another program. Again, that's not something we do. Uh, so a side note on performance. So this graph is slightly contrived to make the point, but what it's trying to indicate here is that little blue line that you'll see is that uniform distribution of traffic uh, with our XDP-based implementation which remains a fairly constant, line, uh, constant irrespective of the nature of the traffic. So in that blue line, in that span was traffic sent to quote unquote the first rule and also a blocked port. The CPU performance remained fairly, um, fairly uh, even. With IP tables, as you can see from the yellow line, it was an order of magnitude different. Again, it's a contrived example to sort of highlight the point. Uh, you know, in practical networks, this is not exactly how it will manifest. So just bear that in mind. It's not end of the world for people using IP tables. All right. So this was great. Um, you know, we implemented a firewall. We wrote our C program. Everybody was happy. We got some solid manageability wins, and um, you know, we got uh, good performance. Uh, within Facebook, then we started. You know having different teams talk about, hey, we are doing some filtering, maybe on a container, maybe on, um, you know, in TC mode. And each team would wonder, all right, you guys did this for your edge infrastructure. How did you do this? And is there something we could leverage? And that's when we went like, yeah, we wrote a C program custom to our logic. So if you want to write another C program, we could give you all our configuration system. And that's when sort of things started to like, oh, well, you're writing custom code, so you know, let's go do our own thing. Uh, you know, let's write our own software. And that's when we realized that, okay, what if we could take the same specification of IP tables, but get all the performance wins of BPF? So the idea is create like a drop-in replacement for IP tables. So you have IP tables, you configure the rules in that language, but you create a BPF program and you associate it at maybe some customizable attach point. It could be XDP mode, it could be TC mode, it could be a container. 
And the idea is let the user space module do most of the work, which is load the BPF maps, verify your consistency in configuration, and have a BPF program do the minimal work. So what is this BPF program going to look like? So this is revisiting our implementation uh, in BPF. So there was a C program. We looked up all the tuples. And our BPF maps were key values, where the values were logical representation on, of a group. Now let's talk about our prototype, which does generic IP tables implementation. So here, the overall scheme remains similar. That is, each packet goes and does a lookup for each tuple in a pre-configured map. But the map's value now is essentially a large bitmap. And the number of bits is equal to the number of rules. So let's say you have 1,000 rules. You have 128 bits, uh, sorry, 1,000 bits, which is like, you know, 128 bytes worth of a, um, uh, an array of uh, UN, UN64s. And what the value is now representing is uh, a one or a zero, which means it's either a match, which means you happen to have specified explicitly the criteria in that specific rule to match that tuple, or it could be a wild card, which again would be a match. Or it could be zero because Maybe somebody else had another criteria in there for that specific tuple. So the idea is we collect all these results. So if you are doing five tuples, you'll have five such huge bitmaps. And now what we try to do is we do a logical and of these five bitmaps, which represents the intersection of all these tuples. And the first bit set indicates the highest order rule that matches your, um, uh, the, the, the IP table rules. So what the BPF program does is, in addition to having issued the lookups for each of the maps, is essentially going through each word, the, the length of the words being reflective of the number of uh, rules that you have, doing a logical and of these words, and trying to find the first bit set. So it's a fairly straightforward BPF program but now it gives you the ability to translate generic IP tables into a BPF program. So from a performance point of view, this was very similar to our custom BPF program. Uh, we didn't notice any difference, which is again obvious, because if you see both the programs are doing map lookups for the same number of tuples, uh, once you get the results, you are essentially doing BPF instructions, which is now you're playing just within branching instructions. And by definition, a BPF program is limited to only X instructions. So one can argue that you can only have so much variance given two different packet streams. So we saw a pretty even line in terms of our CPU utilization, irrespective of the packet stream. Some specifics about this prototype implementation. So we use the output of IP tables save, which is a pretty human readable uh, expression of IP tables, and used a Python loader with BCC helpers to populate all our maps. Uh, and these were per tuple maps. So it was a simple parser for input chains. We had five tuples and TCP flags. We did not subject, uh, support reject rules. Again, we keep, kept it simple with accept and drop, and it was a stateless firewall. So what are the lessons learned from this? So you know, we heard about the BP filter initiative, and we were like, this is great. Like, What if we go back in time and we had a way to transparently map all these IP table rules into a BPF program? It would have certainly taken a lot of our, solved a lot of the problems, which would probably make us reflect harder on the choice to write a custom C program and a custom firewall implementation. And so going back at it, I think we would love to see a, a BP filter implementation which can transparently map IP table rules into a BPF program. And I think there are two ways to go about it. One could be an implicit rather or a transparent way where 
you know, the kernel could imp internally decide that, you know, these IP table rules can be implemented in BPF and I can attach it to wherever the, uh, you know, uh, the user has asked me to, um, which in most cases in the, is in the ingress packet processing path. Or you could make it a more voluntary adoption by creating BP filter options to the IP tables family of tools, uh, basically save, restore, and IP tables, wherein you drive adoption, but in a more voluntary way. I don't have the foresight or rather the context to influence that decision, but I think given the nature of this feature, it's wide usage, we do believe that it is a great way to drive adoption for BPF within the community. Uh, the wins are obvious, and if we can get more, uh, more folks in the community to use BPF and generate more interest, that could be a setting stage to maybe create more features for filtering mechanism uh, and allow for more customizations uh, beyond what IP tables can offer today. So the pitch is basically, you know, you get your IP tables, the same specific specification language, uh, but a much more performant version of it. And it can come with some restrictions because I do believe that most of the folks, you know, who use IP tables out there use a, a certain restrictive set of features and you know, supporting all the possible options might be an arduous task if we were to ever support this in uh, BPF. So here are a few references to some of the things I had mentioned. Um, interestingly, one of our colleagues attended SIGCOM uh, earlier this year and there was a very interesting paper on accelerating uh, Linux security with eBPF which had very similar design ideas about implementing a high performance firewall. So, uh, you know, it, great coincidence that this is happening and we hope, you know, this takes off and one day we can get rid of our C program and just rely on BP filter. Um, any questions? Did you open source? Hey, 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 talk to the <laughs> Uh, did did you open source this work? Uh, no. Uh, so we have so our implementation for the one that we are running in production uh, is fairly specific to our infrastructure. So uh, as I ex showed, it, it's an expression of a policy. So there's not much value in open sourcing that as is. I mean, anybody could write and come up with come up with that policy for their network. Uh, definitely, the the prototype that we wrote. Uh, you know, we are in touch with, uh, you know, Alexi and, and Daniel here, and uh, we haven't really open sourced it yet, but, you know, depending on the feedback, uh, if it's about driving it or, you know, putting up the patches on, uh, you know, GitHub, uh, that's uh, certainly something we could look into. Uh, but our interest here at this point is long term in the, in the sense that we hope that we're, the evolution of PP filter can help us remove some of these custom codes that we have. In our case, this custom C program. Um, without statistics, how do you do attack vector identification? Uh, so we have statistics, but what we don't have is uh, per sort of rule or per port statistics. But as I expressed, uh, you know, typically when we look at our our incoming network data. What we are interested is in looking at metrics of how many packets did we receive from the internet on a bunch of these ports that are open to the internet, or how many packets are flowing between uh, our internal ports that we open only within our network. Uh, while we do lose the granularity of you know ambigu disambiguating between, as in my example, as I said, port 80 and 443, we haven't found that to be a concern because you know, we also have other uh, visibility into incoming traffic to our infrastructure with you know, NetFlow and other kind of sampling. So 
this has not come up yet, but I, as I did call out, you're right that you know, we are losing some fine-grained stats. Interestingly, even though we had those stats, it was the problem of too much data. Like, fine, we had all these stats in IP tables, but what are we doing with it? Um, so so uh, one thing I want to say is that uh, one thing that's really difficult with a project like BP Filter is you always have to create a certain amount of infrastructure and basic functionality before you get that big wave of people jumping onto the project and contributing. And right. I thought we, had, we put enough in there initially to do that, and it wasn't. Um, so people could keep asking, what's, what's going on with BP Filter or whatever? And I know that all we need to do is add more basic functionality so that the framework is there for people to add their use cases to. And I think maybe one of the ways to kind of get around that limitation and get more uh, effort into it is to take the approach you guys did which is to, you know, have this optional thing with IP tables command line that does the BPF code generator, and then we have the code that we need. We would need in the BP filter user mode helper to do the different kinds of IP tables features. It's just sitting somewhere else temporarily until we integrate it into the kernel side. So, uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, the more people who write IP tables imitators that generate BPF code, the better. Uh -huh. And I don't care where it ends up in the end, and I'm really encouraged by the work that you guys are doing in that area. Right. Uh, and and yeah, the, the point is, you know, the, the, the direction forward is uh, part technical and part philosophical. And, you know, how we encourage the community and what are the ways that we nudge them to use it, uh, as you said, it, it is open to discussion. And I like that approach, yeah. Um, in your presentation, you said it was all your stateless. What did you do to like um, stateful traffic? Like, um, did you not have any stateful firewall prior to this? Um, so, in our, as I said, in our implementation, um, you know, given our overall scheme of the network, um, you know, stateful firewalls work given what we wanted to achieve with the firewall in our networking stack. Uh, you'll hear tomorrow from one of our colleagues uh, who will talk about load balancer and uh, you know, how we do stateful tracking there. And given the, the, the entire stack, it, it didn't seem uh, for us necessary to do uh, stateful firewalls. But as I, as I indicated, I do believe that you know, there are multiple projects out there that do connection tracking. And so if you believe this was helpful, uh, don't let uh, the statelessness of this implementation hold you back. Uh, adding, being stateful is uh, a fairly uh, straightforward enhancement to what I just proposed here. Anyone else? Yeah. Do you use this to deploy automatic rules, for example, to mitigate DDoS attacks in any way, or are these all manual, kind of handcrafted rules? Uh, so this is more of a static policy. Um, we have some dynamic controls in our networking stack that we use for various purposes. Um, one of our engineers actually presented, I believe a year ago, uh, a project called Droplet. Droplet sorry, uh, And that is more in line with, with what you just discussed. But it all fits into a very similar ecosystem. But this specific project, we only focus on uh, Pretty static configuration. Also, because it's a pretty uniform deployment across all of our Facebook Edge infrastructure, so um, yeah, we don't want to keep too many moving pieces here. All right, thank you, Anand. Oh, one, hey, wait, one more, one more, one more question. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, so, for the IP tables uh, conversion. How long the conversion program from the from the IP tables rule uh, to to the BPA program? How long it runs? How efficient it is? Because I think that it must be kind of slow, right? Uh, w sorry, what do you mean? How long? Uh, I didn't get that. Uh, the conversion from IP tables rules to the BPF uh, maps and programs, oh. the, the tuples and so on. That seems it could be quite costly, right? Uh, but it's control plane, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Just right. curious. Uh, Actually, we didn't profile. I think we were in a, you know, one of the engineers who helped us with our Shankran is, is sitting right here. Um, 
we did really profile it. We were more in a prototype phase. We wanted to flesh out the concept. Uh, and yeah, this was never a concern, so we didn't really profile it. But if you're interested, we could follow up. Help. The one we have at Cloudflare takes about a second counting the claim compilation to produce right. about, if we have 100 or 200 tools. Yeah. About a second. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we had about, yeah, I, I mean, I would be pulling numbers out of my hat, so I don't want to give you some numbers, but it was never a problem. Like, I wasn't like going for my coffee when, when I was running the script. So, uh, <laughs> all right, thank you very awesome. much. Yeah. Thank you, guys.